I'm going to announce who all the members of the choir are, so you know. Well, Julaine has gotten the choir members these beautiful rainbow scarves. So if you look around and see somebody with one on, but here is the list. We have Chrissy, wave your hand, Chrissy, up there. Julaine, our wonderful director. Kelly, who zooms in from upstate New York. Uh, me and Tina Findell, Tina Wood, and Olivia, who is one of Julaine's voice students. On some of the songs we will be playing tonight, we have people who are no longer in the choir, but they were at the time. So if you listen, you will hear the voices of Grace Knight and Tony, oh, Tony Streeter, and Lynn Wolf. So, yay to all the singers who are providing the, the songs for us tonight. Okay, now we will have our opening words. Sure. Okay. In this night, the stars left their habitual places and kindled wildfire tidings that spread faster than sound. In this night, the shepherds left their posts to shout the new slogans into each other's clogged ears. In this night, the foxes left their warm burrows. And the lion spoke with deliberation. This is the end revolution. In this night, <laughs> roses fooled the earth and began to bloom in the snow. Dorothy, Dorothy Soli. Please join us in singing, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day.
The foxes came out of their holes and the and the dogs perused the church. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Well, um, I am going to jump in because we have the story for all ages. And the title of the book is Great Joy. And, pardon me. It was written by Kate D. Camillo, illustrated by Bagram Ibatulin. The week before Christmas, a monkey appeared on the corner of Fifth and Vine. He was wearing a green vest and a red hat, and with him was a man, an organ grinder, who played music for the people on the street. In the daytime, when the sun shone, the sequins on the monkey's vest glittered and flashed. From the window of her apartment, Frances could see the tin cup he held out to the people who walked by. Sometimes, if it was very quiet for just a minute, she could hear the music. It came across the crowded sidewalk and through, up through the streets. And even though the organ grinder and the monkey were just across the street, the song sounded sad and far away, like the music from a dream. Where do they go at night, Frances asked. Who, said her mother. That man and his donkey. Oh, Frances, said her mother. Don't ask me questions I can't answer. I'm sure they go somewhere. Everyone goes somewhere. But where, said Frances. I have no idea, said her mother. Turn around. Frances turned. Her mother pinned the bottom of her robe. There, said her mother. Now all I have to do is hem it and you'll be ready. Have you memorized your line? Yes, said Frances. Are you excited about the pageant? Yes, said Frances. And she turned away from her mother and looked out the window at the monkey. That night, Frances made herself stay awake. She hummed songs and set her multiplication tables. She named the capitals of each state, St. Paul, Tallahassee, Harrisburg, one after the other. Every time she felt as if she might fall asleep, she shook her head and pinched her arm and opened her eyes wide. Finally, at midnight, Frances got out of bed and crept down the hallway to the living room. She looked down into the street. She saw the organ grinder, but where was the monkey? Her, her heart thumped, and then she saw him tucked inside the man's overcoat, his small red hat still on his head. Look at me, Frances whispered. Look up here. It was the organ grinder who looked up. He took his cap from his head and raised it to her. They sleep on the street, Frances said the next morning, even when it snows. Oh, Frances, said her mother. Maybe they could come for dinner? No, they can't come for dinner, said her mother. Why not? They're strangers, that's why. Eat your breakfast, Frances. You've got a big day ahead of you. All that day it snowed, but by evening, in time for the pageant, the sky cleared. The snow was so deep that Frances had to wear her boots for the walk to the church. The organ grinder and the monkey were still on their corner. Frances ran up and put a nickel in the monkey's cup. I'm going to be in the Christmas play tonight, she said. I get to wear wings and I have one line to say. Do you want to hear it? Frances, her mother said, we're going to be late. Let's go. You can come, Frances said, turning back. The play is at the church. It's just down the street. You can both come. The organ grinder smiled at her, but his eyes looked sad. At the church, everyone else was already in costume. Hurry, the choir director said as he helped Frances put on her wings. The shepherds walked out first, and then the choir director pointed to Frances. Now, he whispered. Frances stood Frances stood very still. She opened her mouth, but the words would not come. Say it, whispered one of the shepherds. Say it, hissed an angel who did not have any lines of her own. The camel, which was really two people, swayed nervously back and forth. But Frances could not speak. All she could think about was how cold it was outside, how sad the organ grinder's eyes were, even when he smiled. The world was quiet. Everyone waited. 
then at the back of the sanctuary, a door opened. Behold, she shouted, I bring you tidings of great joy. And because the words felt so right, Francis said them again, great joy. The end. I hope you will join me in uh, saying our affirmation that June will put up for us. There it is. The reason that we are here is love, love is the doctrine the of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament and service is the prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve the needs of all beings, to the end that all souls shall grow in the harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. Thank you for sharing that. And now we will receive our offering. Uh, donations for the ongoing work of this congregation and food for the family center. But wait a minute, it's not for our church, go ahead, you guys can pass the plate. <laughs> we are donating tonight to the World Food Program, where our own Jeff Taftik um, had his career. And they are feeding people all around the world who need food. So give generously as you can. today 
is on our theme for the year, the great turning from empire to earth community. And we thought it would be appropriate to uh, share with you some of the quotes from our book, The Great Turning, about Jesus. And Anne Marie, are you there? I am right here. I am ready. Okay. Okay. Uh, we made a promise to each other and to this community to um, honor the work of David Corton. Um, and here we are tonight on the third Sunday, and we are honoring our commitment, and we are honoring solstice, and uh, some of us are honoring Hanukkah. So I just wanted to share with you a few words from David Corton's book, The Great Turning, on Jesus and his work in the world. David Corton says, contemporary religious scholars describe the historical Jesus as a person for whom spirit was an experiential reality, a teacher of wisdom who used parables and aphorisms to communicate subversive wisdom. <laughs> Jesus was a scholar and a social prophet who challenged the elite's power by disputing conventional wisdom. He was a devoted person to breaking down the barriers that supported the imperial structures of his day. He dedicated his life to changing the prevailing stories. So here we are today and we're telling stories and we're changing them as we need to. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Mm -hmm. When you think of Christmas, we're talking about the birth of Jesus. And there are the, the carols that you hear tonight speak of peace on earth, the coming of this one baby, reminds people of peace on earth. We are making the connection tonight, not just about the birth of Jesus, but what he did as a, a grown person, as Anne-Marie said, was changing the prevailing stories. The Roman Empire was about as strict and harsh as you can get. And Jesus, what we feel today, what resonates with so many of us when we come to this holiday season and we sing songs of good cheer and of peace on earth, why does that stand out? because it's a different story to the prevailing one. And so many of us resonate with that. And we think of it at Christmas. Some of us don't forget, but it seems like the larger social order does forget. And we go back to war and competition. And yet at Christmas, we remember and as Anne-Marie said, Jesus fought the prevailing order in large part through stories and parables. And I'm going to uh, quote two of them just as examples of uh, the way he changed prevailing stories. The first one is the parable of salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be? 
how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. What could he have been talking about? Wisdom hidden in those words. And the parable of light, I'm sure you all have heard. Nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a basket. It's set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify our Heavenly Father. So, we want to shine a light on the, the uh, subversive wisdom of today. How can we bring it all these some 2,000 years later where we still have war and fighting among nations, um, among races, people who are starving, people who are migrating because they have no good place to be, how can we change the prevailing stories? So I've been had to jumpstart a discussion period about this, which, which uh, Anne-Marie and Sharon have, uh, thank you, she got the light, uh, have got us going on. And I'm just gonna read a couple more quotes uh, from David Corton and then ask a couple of questions that hopefully we can all think about and maybe offer some responses to. The quote, the spirit model suggests a living cosmos that continues to grow and evolve as the eternal spirit continuously manifests itself by existence. By the understanding of this model, the spirit of creation, the ground of being, is manifest in every person, creature, rock, particle, and so on. Therefore, we are quite literally living in relationship with spirit in every aspect of every minute of our lives. Um, I'm so happy that we have another creature here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we have a wonderful dog friend here with us today, and it's, it's very fitting and very nice. Uh, the two questions that we are going to throw out here, what is our responsibility to this creation? And how are you expressing your own subversive wisdom? <laughs> They're kind of loaded questions. <laughs> so uh, we're opening it up uh, in whatever way, you feel drawn to respond to any of us, it would be great and uh, hopefully have some discussion about, about these issues. So, and from Zoom land or here, please feel free. And I trust that um, <laughs> our part of our worship team on Zoom will catch when somebody has something to say. And, uh, We'd love to hear from you as well. So I think one of the um, actions that I have decided to take in my life is to not support parts of the, our economy whose uh, methods I really don't believe in, that they are not helpful for the people involved in the system. So therefore, I don't shop at Walmart. And why is that? Because 
the people at the top make lots and lots of money and the people who work there barely get by. That doesn't seem fair to me. I also do my best to not shop with Amazon. Same principle. It's where do you spend your money? What do you give energy to? How do we change those stories by our actions? Anybody else have thoughts like that? Or your own way of? I would, just, I would just add that, um, you know, what you were saying, what, where do we put our energy? And, and to just take that, even to pick that apart one more step and say, really, when you think about it, where you spend your money is where you're spending your energy because you get your money by expending your energy in a job or something. So, you know, it, 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 it tumbles down. You, you may think it doesn't really connect to your energy, but it does because everything that you do that gives you the funds to be able to spend in the right or wrong place is energy that you have put forth that you are are expending into the world so i just want to kind of tag that on to what sharon said we think about that a lot here in this house great kelly what sorry somebody calling on me kelly. Kelly. Okay, I'm on Zoom and I put into the chat um, the two questions that I copied out of the transcript as I'm thinking about it. And I think the expression of subversive wisdom is leading by example and um, doing things that make others take pause. Um, by showing them that there is a better way to do something when you're in com competition with somebody by and winning by doing something that is better for the whole community rather than just the two parties that are trying to get a business upper hand um, and uh, being willing to contribute your own resources gifts and time toward an end goal that isn't necessarily money. Um, it, it's if what I do is improving the world, then that's worth my resources. I don't have to earn money at it to, at uh, one thing or another. Thanks, Kelly. Well said. <laughs> yeah. Uh. And of darling, course, I think you've had your hand up for a while. I immediately Anne. think there's many things to think of in, in line with that. And my, in the past few years, passion here to try to have less mowing, for instance, as an example, and more uh, possibilities for pollinators and so on. And uh, it, it's wonderful, though, how how things can move in that. You know, we try, we got. The hospital hill, the administrator agreed you no know, mowing on some of the steep hillsides, and then they have a new administrator come in and he won't have anything to do with it. So now they're back to mowing. And so where do we take it from here? And I've been trying to think of presenting, making a presentation to the hospital board, never mind school board and town board, select board. And I just recently got a um, something from Chuck Gregory that they want to put on a post on the trail, the walking trail that we have through Springfield. Well, uh, it won't be written on a post, but it will be something you can poke on your cell phone and you'll hear this blur. And he had this written out about how important it is to have these areas for pollinators. And it was very well written. And I thought, wow, this is, this is what I need to present to the different boards and so on. And I will be meeting with Chuck sometime this week to talk more about this, uh, this little piece, but it, it was a wonderful resonance of energy and uh, subversive <laughs> uh, ways of not, you know, it, it's just changing the way people do, that we do things and how to help people get on board with changes that are 
really more beneficial for us in most ways um, when they've been so used to another way of doing it. And uh, it, it's the, even something as simple as not mowing so much. Uh, people think it's, <laughs> you know, it looks terrible. Well, not when you know what all the mowing is doing to the ground and the insects and the birds. No, it doesn't, mowing, mowing looks like a desert to me now. It isn't pretty at all. <laughs> But anyway, enough on my part, just mm. as the example you all know that I'm working on. <laughs> Let's have some, any other examples from people of that kind of thing that trying to make the change. Um. Anne? Hi. Hi, thanks. Um, well, those of you who know me know I do my best to subvert the dominant paradigm <laughs> every day. <laughs> Um, and particularly around gender and uh, nuclear power. Um, but I, I, I read this thing in my newspaper the other day that's really been going through my head and it really uh, resonates with what you all have been saying. Um, and I, I kind of feel like the, one of the things it says, that one of the ways one of the most important uh, critical ways we can subvert the dominant paradigm is to feel connected to our earth, just to walk around knowing that we are all part of something much bigger. Um, and that this particular, um, anyway, it ties into the Christmas story, which I, you know, so I just wanted to read it if I may. Um, it's just a couple okay. paragraphs. The heart of the Christmas story lives beyond rational thought in a story world of imponderable depth and beauty. Against all odds, it sings of throwing the mighty down from their thrones and lifting up the lowly of good news to the poor, release for the captives and liberation for the oppressed. Even now, after all these years, sometimes I can only stand and marvel at the whole improbable scene. Angels, unlikely parents, no room at the inn. Animals, a barn, shepherds, exotic strangers, a certain star. Uh -huh. Rumors of a miraculous occurrence are announced first to farm workers and foreigners. There's a child at the center of all this. I stand immobilized beneath starry winter skies, my imagination running rampant as chills dance up and down my spine. We have the whole rest of the year to search for understanding and meaning. Right now, I'm waiting for the light to appear, wherever it is, whatever it means, however it comes. I'm searching the skies for winged radiances. I'm hoping for goosebumps. <laughs> I'm on the lookout for the incomprehensible. I'm trying to break out of the little house of my ordinary world. Enough of explanations, farewell, for now to theology and historical Jesus studies, I am ready for the ancient winds to burst again out of the far mountains and across the plains. I stand braced against the edge of the world, waiting for a random gust to brush my face with incarnation. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, uh, a piece by uh, a a retired Christian um, minister. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That, uh, I, I wait. I wait waiting ahead. for a random gust to brush my face with incarnation. Ooh. Thanks, Anne. Wow. Yeah. That's a good way to. <laughs> Well, part of what I see is um, doing the work and envisioning the world we want. How would we want things to be different? Oh, okay. Listen to Bernie Sanders. <laughs> um, you know, health care for all. Let's make sure that everyone has some sort of housing that they, there's nobody outdoors in the winter freezing to death, that we care enough about people to, to offer that, that 
the people who don't have any homes are uh, multiplying. And why is that so? What, what kind of people are we that we allow that to happen? And I, I don't mean you or you individually. I mean, we as a society, you know. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and uh, you know, we want a world, do you remember Diane a few years ago at Parker Hill we you you wrote down the things and I did save them what kind of world do we want no plastic yeah mm -hmm. you know uh, let's find some other way to store our food I really want to do that more and more and I I invite us to help each other if you figure out some way to not use plastic to put your food in. Let's share it. Let's try and change our behaviors so they're more in tune with the earth. I, I think we we need to figure out ways to voice that. Uh, I've often thought maybe getting a petition expressing our wish to not only the, the local food co-op, but maybe the even larger stores that we'd like to see less less food in plastic. You know, it used to be that you would never put anything that was acidic or that had fat like peanut butter or acidic like ketchup and mayonnaise and all those things were always put in glass. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that slowly that trend is just about everything is in plastic mm -hmm. and we know that the interaction between the food and the plastic is not healthy and yet not it, it, it's so the convenience factor has overwhelmed all of that um i won't buy a lot of things if you know i now only want to buy cheese that's in waxed in that waxed um because i know the cheese that's next to that plastic has an off taste and I'm not, I don't trust what's going on between that cheese and the plastic. Um, so I scrape, if I get it, I scrape the a thin layer off where it's been next to the plastic. Um, but I think it's important to communicate uh, that we would like it to be different, you know, to, to as many places as we can. And if we could get a petition together with even a hundred signatures, um, that would, oh, really, you know, I think it would have an impact. Oh, wait, you know, jog people um, a little bit on that. So, yes. Yes. We have a couple people on Zoom with their hands up. Okay. Cool. Chrissy? Hey there. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to everyone's suggestions and stories of their subversiveness. I'm all for subversive too. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I perceive that the people that people need to have a change in here before they can make a change out there when it comes to reordering their worldviews and their priorities. And that one way to do that is to live from your heart. And we haven't been taught how to do that in our culture. So living from the heart for me also involves being polite and pleasant so that I don't hurt anyone else's heart while I'm out and about. If I am feeling not fit for public consumption, I stay home. <laughs> <laughs> So how do I, how, what is my subversiveness? Well, I model patience, pleasantness, and politeness, and I've cut profanity out of my vocabulary. So just by being out and about, and because people haven't taught, been taught how to be polite, I mean, really, I have no idea because it hasn't been modeled for them. Mm -hmm. So my pleasant, warm heart energy, being pleasant and polite helps their energy fields and their subconscious learn how to be that way and to feel comfortable being that way because 
they know what it looks like because they've seen it and heard it. Um, so that's my goal. I don't go out when I'm not fit for public consumption. And I follow the four Ps, patient, pleasant, polite, no profanity. That works for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. Let's do one more. I, we have that's Anne Marie. I just wanted to say, you know, I was giving this uh, some thought because I actually was part of the worship and arts committee that I am. So I had probably a little more time than some of you in the sanctuary there. What is our responsibility to creation? I just love that question. And, you know, tonight is Hanukkah and we are surrounded by amazingly heart-filled people here in the sanctuary there and I know so many of you on Zoom so dearly at this point, but my answer to this, we are called to fall in love, to fall in love with the world that we are in and with the people and the souls and the spirits that we have the honor to work with. I have grown so much in this community and my, my heart is moved by so many of you and the work that you do. Um, I guess I'm gonna say that you're my dear ones. Oh. That's the work of creation. Fall in love with creation. Fall in love with yourself. Fall in love with each other. <laughs> and um, happy Hanukkah and a wonderful solstice. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank Anne you, Anne Marie. <laughs> and okay, Tony. Is that and is that um, that's it? Okay. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Tony. No, I just want to on Zoom. I just so, want to say that a um, few things for me that are really important is to think globally. We are a world community, not just the United States, not just you know one country or anything. And lately. Um, when our power went out, I thought of the people in Ukraine who have no power, and I'm sure you all know we that. that too. Too. Yeah. It comes to your mind, and you say, my God, we were without power for, I don't know how many hours, maybe 18 hours, and it's cold over there, and my heart goes out to so many people all over the, all over the world who are suffering and who have, um, it's, just, it's just overwhelming. And uh, I like to think of that, and I like to try to live a simple, a simple lifestyle, not to want a lot of stuff. And and uh, that seems to always be the answer to everything is to buy more. And I don't think that is the answer. I think I think you all have said, you all have said what the answers are. You know, but today it comes from it comes from your heart, and uh, we just have to have big hearts. And, uh, and be generous and uh, care and appreciate the beauty that is all around us too. I like to put out beautiful pictures on uh, uh, of the earth and, and my hope is that if people see the beauty there, they won't want to destroy it, you know, mm -hmm. they will love it. And, uh, and then I go the other way where, where, I, where I'm angry and some of my artwork is very, is very dark because I also feel that too, between, mm -hmm. between those mm -hmm. two things. But that's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you, Tony. Tony. Thank you, Tony. Uh, uh, Dick has his hand up. Is there time? Sure. Let's make time. Hi, Dick. Yes, I had to unmute myself first. Oh. Um, I guess I'll answer some of the questions about uh, subversive uh, energy. Was that the term that was used? Subversive wisdom. Ah, subversive wisdom. Okay. Well, it goes back quite a long way. Um, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is an engineering school, and graduated with a master's degree in 1968. And a couple of years before that, um, I took some courses which acquainted me with global warming and the threat of that coming. Um, and uh, so when Stephanie and I got married in 1974, um, we built our house in Andover at that time off the grid. 
And one of the ways we were able to do that was that we installed a Clevis Multrum composting toilet, um, which was a fairly new thing at that time. It was a Swedish invention, basically a sloping uh, fiberglass tank into which went both um, human waste and kitchen scraps. And after a long process became compost. And we bought serial number five manufactured in the United States. So we're fairly early on that um, technology, if you want to call it that. And we actually car topped the parts of the uh, tank from Shield Yachts in Rockland, Maine, which is where they were made. And in the process of using that over the years, we, we came acquainted with how you could safely compost human waste. And uh, I later became active in the Green Mountain Club, which built and maintains the long trail from Massachusetts to Canada, 272 miles. And there's, it's not easy when there are a lot of hikers uh, staying at the shelters to uh, take care of their waste properly. And I developed a design of a composting toilet that would be workable in the back country and um, supervised the first installation at Little Rock Pond in 1997. And the Green Mountain Club was um, skeptical, I guess would be a good word to use. And it took quite a long time to become uh, confident that this would work. But this summer, uh, the club converted the last of uh, privies, uh, outhouses, holes in the ground on the long trail system. There are about 70 overnight sites and they all now have moldering composting toilets um, based on that design. And they're also used in several hundred places uh, in other parts of the country. There are quite a few of them on the Appalachian Trail and in the White Mountain National Forest. And so, um, spanning a period of time of what 34 50 some odd years um that was i think a defensible bit of uh subversive wisdom <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah good job that's that's a great uh, if, if there's nobody else that's a great way to uh, and yeah, and we'll close this for now. But what a great example! Yeah, let's too. keep the discussion going. Yeah, let's yeah. share yeah. our ideas of how we can switch to a more humane, caring, falling in love with creation yeah. and world we all <laughs> want. Yeah, but oh, we've got one here just falling in love with everybody. <laughs> and Janice, what is this dog's name? It's Reggio Emilio. And then they encamped from a small community in Italy that was bombed during World War II. Oh. When it was rebuilt, the, the, the community wanted to focus on the young children. And yes. the, what came out of it was the curriculum of Reggio Emilio. And I, as an early childhood person, felt that my, somebody in my family needed to be named. Reggio, <laughs> that's and great. Reggie for short. Reggie, Reggie, Reggio, Reggio. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so to be continued. <laughs> yeah. The next thing on the program tonight is it came upon a midnight clear. Please sing along.
the time for us to form a circle I'm thinking it there aren't enough of us to go all the way around all the chairs but maybe we could make a circle somewhere around here and a reminder as June dims the lights that well I will light the candle my candle from the chalice and then I will pass it to my right and to my left. And if you remember, and all those people who clean, we don't want spilled wax on the rug. So when I light my candle, then Hallie will dip hers. Come, to come forward over here. Come this way. Becky, come on in front here. Yeah, can you come over here so we have and, more and of a move circle? This, yeah. Maybe move this circle a little bit. Um, Rob, come in a little bit more. There you go. Oh, yeah. That's it. Feel free to light your candle anytime and join in with the light. Chrissy has hers. <laughs> okay. okay. Hold your candle upright. I'm so happy that we're back in the sanctuary. you a winter solstice prayer. I cannot remember the first name of the man who wrote this, but his last name is Hayes, H-A-Y-S. 
a winter solstice prayer. The dark shadow of space leans over us. We are mindful that the darkness of greed, exploitation, and hatred also lengthens its shadow over our small planet Earth. As our ancestors feared death and evil and all the dark powers of winter, we fear that the darkness of war, discrimination, and selfishness may doom us and our planet to an eternal winter. May we find hope in the lights we have kindled on this sacred night, hope in one another and in all who form the web work of peace and justice that spans the world. In the heart of every person on this earth burns the spark of luminous goodness. In no heart is there total darkness. May we who have celebrated this winter solstice by our lives and service, by our prayers and love, call forth from one another the light and the love that is hidden in every heart. Amen. Amen. chalice because oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> quite a few people to get through.